Uh, Clark, I have a question for you, buddy. Uh -oh. For you, the first thing was like a diaper or a kimono? No personal <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing that they gave you, Clark, was like a pants, a belt, and a gi. Here we go. This is what you have right now. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think they were both introduced around the same time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, for fun. sure, like, you know, uh, it was always, uh, be, like, just jujitsu was, like, always a part of, of my life. Like, from, from as little as I can remember, I remember, like, my dad showing us uh, kids, you know, like, training videos, uh, you know, in those days it was really rare. You know, there was only a very few, but, you know, those uh, early uh, MMA, not even, Barely even MMA videos were around back then, but but uh, challenge matches mostly, I think, were like what my dad had. Challenge matches in garages and stuff like that. So I kind of like grew up and then my dad's like, this is my brother, this is my cousin over here. And I'm like watching this, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Family, all right. You know, so Master Carlson was in a lot of those. Uh, watching Carlson Jr. compete as, uh, you know, in, in the... I forget the name of the event. I think it was like extreme fighting or something like that uh, when he fought MMA. My dad was actually there in his corner. I know you guys are close with, with Carlson and the team. So, but yeah, it's been amazing. What would you guys like to work on today? Do you guys want to do like technique or are there certain things you guys want to, want to touch on, topics? Well, uh, Professor, if you, if you don't mind showing us a few techniques, and then uh, I'm sure that will open up the window for a lot of questions as you go. And we'll probably just jump through that, if that's okay with you. Yeah, do you guys have a, a topic that you guys are working on right now? I'm coming well, in with like a clean slate, so. Yeah, clean slate. Well, uh, he, he, so, so we're in Colorado. Buyu, of course, is in Miami. Amir is in Michigan. And so we got all, all of our students, or a lot of our students from all over. Uh, and then even from outside of that with us. So we all kind of are running off a little bit different curriculum, but I guess, I mean, it would be uh, silly for us not to ask you about your setups for Omo Plata. <laughs> <laughs> if if sure. you're starting yeah. there, then maybe we can go from there. For sure. Yeah, happy to show you guys some of that stuff. And I think some of the, the setups, you know, that I do, you guys will probably might be familiar with some of them. Maybe there, it's more about some of the littler details, some of the little details that make the big difference. And then while you're in Omo Plata, I think uh, a lot of people end up losing it because of like lack of having the correct response to the person's escape. So I think for any position, just something to think about, you know, any position that you would like to master, something that you like to do, let's say everybody may have something that they're like, you know, they like doing, or even just think about your last submission. I think uh, you have to understand first, your opponent's escapes to that position. You have to be able to anticipate all of your opponent's actions from within the submission, reactions, escapes, anything they're gonna, however they're gonna maybe react to give you a hard time. Then once you understand that, you can start to build a more complete attack to any position. Because then you can anticipate the next move. You're always thinking one step ahead. So I like to, you know, talk about that kind of thing. And, and usually I can show things that people aren't familiar with. And um, because usually most people don't study the omoplata that well, you know. So it's, a lot of times it's the little things from within. But I can start out for sure with one of, uh, with some, with some uh, entries to the omoplata. Okay. Um, let's see what's a good one. Are you guys okay with, with the way it, uh, the video is right now? Should I turn it landscape or should I keep it portrait like that? Uh, if, you can, <laughs> if you can turn it landscape, maybe you might be able to see a little bit more. Okay, let me see. I'm not sure if it'll accommodate you, but there you go. Yeah. Perfect. Let's see. Let's see, Let's see if that's better. Tip it down a little bit so you can see more of the ground. More than that. Okay, so I want to uh, thank you guys for putting this together. Uh, it's an honor for me to be invited by Professor Buyu. Thank you so much for, for having me. And 
Brandon came through last minute to help out to be uh, here with me and, and demonstrate some moves for you guys. So thank you very much. Otherwise, I would just be gossiping with you guys about Jiu-Jitsu news. <laughs> so let's do a little bit of, um, I'll show you guys one of my favorite entries from here, <clears throat> from the guard. And I can show you guys from top, bottom, like a couple different positions, if you're interested, you know, about the Omoplata. But uh, I'll show you guys an, uh, an entry that's not super basic. It was one of my favorite first entries. Okay. So this one is going to be from Lasso Guard. Right, so if I have his sleeve with that rolling grip, and I'm making sure I'm blocking either with my hand or with my foot on his hip, okay? Then my foot comes over and I'm in the lasso guard, right? Hey. Is that Sheila? What's up, Sheila? Are you live or are you here? We're live. Are you live? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, so I have the lasso, lasso in right here, okay? I'm blocking everything on this side, and I'm going to hook on the outside here. So I'm in lasso, I'm going to give myself some space with my left foot here. I think this is a detail that people don't use on this one. I'm going to pulse on his hip, so I'm controlling distance here, right? My knuckles are going to be leaning posting on my own leg right here, okay? So I'm controlling how close he gets to me with my foot on the hip, okay? And my knuckles here, controlling how far he can pull out. My hand is always guarding, okay? And then my foot, my toes more specifically, is gonna post on the mat. My forehead goes to the mat to spin through, okay? So this is one that I think a lot of people know. They say they know but I think people might not use it because they are missing a couple of details. One big detail I see a lot of people doing, even teaching, is staying flat on their backs and spinning like this. And it gets pretty hard to spin under, and a lot of times he ends up smashing me here and uh, possibly even passing my guard. So it's really important that for me, like I'm doing a sideways roll, that I come off my back and onto my shoulder like this. That's why also it's important that my toes are on the floor like I want to do a sideways roll. So my butt comes into the air, my, my forehead goes into the mat. Okay. Then my head comes all the way out using my leg to open. And then as soon as I can, I'm looking to build a wall and come up. I don't want to hang out here too long. I don't want to make any grips here because this is a territory where he can easily start to create a lot of problems for me. So I want to put him behind me. Right now the mat is behind me. I want to get up and put him behind me, okay? And a lot of times what I, the way I teach to get up is not straight up, but it's on your side. Because when you get up in a Mokada also, if I come straight up, and if he comes straight up right now, posture, it's like a battle that I'm gonna lose, okay? So when I say to get up, I come up to my elbow, and my knees are gonna bring him to me. Okay, so my knees pull him over. At the same time, my hand comes up and I give him a hug. So this is very different than sitting up straight. Okay, and then once I'm here, I'm very, I'm, I'm naturally very far forward. And again, if I try to sit forward from here, he's gonna lift me up easily. Okay, put me back down. You guys can, can check this position by seeing where are your hips. If your hips are right next to your partner's knee, like I am right now, then you're way too far forward. If your hips are in front or next to the knee. So think about scooting back all the way where your hips are aligned with your partner's hips or aligned with your partner's ankle. So I go all the way back. I'm also biting down with my ribs on his wrist, okay? All the while controlling his body, Positioning my legs, probably you guys know this part, no problem. Not crossing your legs here, using your foot to help you come up. Don't leave your foot so far back, bring it close, and then bring your head towards his head. So very, like a natural finish. Right? And then once you're here, there's a lot of things that can happen too. You can roll different directions, and then we, we find a lot more, uh, we find a lot of dynamic ways to, to make the finish happen with that. 
So just, I think there was a couple of details there that I hope, hopefully I can share with you guys that might be new and, uh, and you guys can put to practice. That, that was awesome. Um, if you don't mind, continue with that uh, theme and, and showing us maybe some common defenses that, that you have trouble with other than maybe the posture or even including the posture and how you deal with that. Right, okay. So common defenses. Do you have a specific one? Because there's a lot. Well, yeah, like anyone that like, what would you use in different areas of the fight there? Well, so maybe me, one of you guys that are in the gi over here. Yeah, there you uh, go. You guys can demonstrate if you can. Oh, we're gonna have some people wearing the gi with partners, so that's, that's gonna great. be that's gonna be interesting. Yeah, <laughs> if you guys wanna try, or if you guys wanna show me any of your the escapes that you like to use, I, I've seen a lot, so uh, I'd love to see what you guys would would do. That way, when I come to your school, I'll be ready. <laughs> ah, boy, I like that, Clark. <laughs> I know, uh, Clark. I know there is one that uh, when the guy. I mean, I'm sorry. Your friend's name is Brandy. Brandon. Brandon. I know when Brandon has his arm tangled, like he usually. I, I, I learned that. I don't know if it was Manny Mao or something, somebody that they put their hands together under the hips and they tend to roll them over. You know what I'm talking about? So you have your arm tangled. That's yeah. right. Then you sideways roll. Yeah, sideways. Yeah. And you, and you haul up for it. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that's the one that Tom's talking about, but that's the first one that came up to my mind right now. Besides the yeah. one that you backflip and things like that. You know what I mean? So, uh, Brendan, you, you, we will take advantage as grabbing the hands together, waiting for you to come up and then flip you all on their over. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like that. Dispense. We can uh, definitely go I, over I'm, that. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You, you pick and choose whatever you want. And just catching up oh. whatever um, Professor Tom said it and apply it to it. And if you have some guests, they want to participate on the live, bro, that's fine. I see you looking on the side, right? That's fine. They can come up. <laughs> I had a – the academy was empty, and I had a couple uh, – one of my – one of the instructors came in here just to grab some of his things. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, thank but you. But you know what I'm talking about? The one that I grabbed the hands together, you know, and then – yeah. that's the first one that just came out of my mind you know yeah my mind was more uh it do you do you see because you use this so well and so effectively do you feel like at a, a lower level or moderate level or a higher level where you are do people typically do different things or do they still try to roll first or try to jump over your body with their legs or you know you strength and posture what are some of the, the defenses people do to try and get out of your omoplata and how do you deal with that? That's really kind of what I was hoping for. Well, I get a lot of people now, you know, people are getting more yeah, familiar with you wrestling? Sorry? I heard somebody say something I didn't understand. No? All right, Professor, that was accidental. You can go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, people are looking for a lot of um, counters a lot of the time. Even like toe holds, um, they're looking for ways to step over and pass the guard to give me a hard time. Uh, certain grips that people are making, you know, uh, can be can make it difficult. But uh, patience is important too with, with uh, I think any submission, but definitely also omoplata, and uh, that will help a lot. But it's a position that people can get stuck. It's hard to shake off. And uh, anyways, I'll get started. I'll show a few. And, um, and as we go along, if you guys think of something you want to see, I'm happy to do that, okay? So let's see. Like Professor is saying, I'm here in this position, right? Now, the time that I, that I would recommend doing the escape that Professor Buyu is talking about is usually when the guy starts to come up to get the finish. Because at that moment, I become lighter, right? I start to elevate myself. So we'll demonstrate that here, okay? Sorry, should have done that. Uh, you just gonna roll me to your left, right? So, so when, I, when I start to come up, he puts his leg up behind me. And as I come up, he tries to roll me this way, right? And then, in order not to get stuck in side control, he's got to quickly scramble to his knees. Right? He's got to turn up quick. And it kind of ends up being a scramble a lot of the time, right? Depending on how quick your partner reacts. Professor, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. Cool. Great. I'm glad I got the right one. So, 
I think this is a great defense. Okay, like I said, it's probably when I, when I would teach the escapes, this is like I said, the last defense because you're looking at elevating your partner. Like right now, Brandon's in position, ready to roll me sideways for, so that when I elevate my hips off the ground, I become light. Now, what I like to do is, um, is another roll here, okay? So when he goes to take me over, instead of landing on my knees, I'm gonna stop with my foot. So you see my foot lands here. My hand stays on his elbow so it doesn't escape. I stop it, the, the movement with my foot, and then I'm gonna tuck and get behind him again, okay? Once I land here, I'll look to finish in a different way. A lot of times it's gonna be connecting on his shoulder, pulling down on his shoulder, really close to his neck. So not really close to his shoulder. I don't wanna let it escape. I could be pulling from the collar or hands together like gable grip, pull down heavy. Can you guys see me there? Yeah. Okay, and then just a little hip escape using my free leg. Pull down strong and then hip escape to finish. Another one that I like a lot, especially when the guy's leaning on me here trying to finish, is I'll take his lapel and I'll pass it to my hand. Once I pass off the lapel, then I can cross my legs and just stretch him out. So this is a nice one because a combination choke and shoulder lock. Depending on the person's flexibility, they may tap, you know, depending uh, from both or one or the other. So this is a little bit dynamic because you're, you're forward rolling with your partner, right? You're sticking with it. One of the big things I tell people in the Omoplata is when your partner goes to get out, a lot of people will think about it like, oh, this is a good opportunity for me to take two points, right? Easy two points because a person is taking the bottom position in order to escape the submission and they take the top position. And that's why I think a lot of people let it go. But I'm not letting it go there, you know? And I encourage you guys to try to stay with the submission because keep in mind, it is still a submission. Regardless if you're on top, if you're on the bottom, if you're in normal plata, you're, you're in a submission. Like you see the way I finished right now, the last one was very different than like your traditional sit up normal plata finish. If you guys want me to show it again, I can, but this is a, uh, one more time. Okay. Do it, please. So I'll show the whole thing. Okay, so from last to guard. Okay, this time he's standing on my side, so the lasso goes in easy. My foot's nice and deep. Okay, for the spin, I'll make sure I'm, I have plenty of space. My foot is on the inside hip. And then here, using my, my right leg, I'm going to come onto my shoulder and go all the way through. Okay, as soon as I can, I'm coming up. And then moving back, moving back here. Okay, so I want to scoop back behind his knee. I don't want to give any chance for him to be able to elevate me here. And the more I move back, the harder it is for him to posture. Okay, uh, move over this way a little bit. So we're going to do off screen. Then when I want to do that to finish, he's going to roll me over, right? So I use this foot to stop. Okay. Don't just tuck your head without using your foot. You have to stop it first, otherwise you can hurt your neck. Okay. Then here, I'm gonna either reach for his collar, if I can, this is a like, huge guarantee you're gonna finish it, or the shoulder. You can pull down and use your free leg for a hip escape. Okay, either way, you go for the choke, for no gi, you can come in, in front of the neck. Just hold your hands together and stretch. Also good. Mackenzie Dern did something similar to this. Not necessarily the entire thing. I don't know how she got there, but she finished from that position on her back. But she put on a full rear naked choke while within the, uh, the omoplata. Does anybody remember that? It was a few years ago. Who was remember. that, Professor? Uh, Mackenzie Dern doing Mackenzie a... Mackenzie Dern, yes. Yeah, a rear naked choke in a... It may have been the uh, UFC. Right? I think it was in a UFC, yeah. Yeah, one of her first fights. 
She never gave me credit for that, but it's okay, I forget. <laughs> well, I think that picture that we have at the, at the social media today, I mean, that picture should be on the Guinness book for some reason, how, because, and as a matter of fact, you never, you don't, you're not going to believe it. Uh, that guy, Ken Primola, I used to teach private lessons for him when I was in Philadelphia, as soon as I move in. Oh, yeah? Yeah, man. <laughs> he's a nice guy. He's a good lawyer. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, okay. man. He's a good people. Yeah. But that was, that was amazing. I mean, I, I, uh, I don't know if a professor has questions because I don't have the chat. I do, professor. professor. Okay, you don't mind, Professor, professor yes, Park. Yes, we have a question from Liz. Uh, she's having difficulty finishing the omoplata. Uh, she says, what if somebody grabs your legs when you're trying to come up? That happens to her often. Grabs the leg uh, when I'm trying to come up. Okay, let me see if I can get what you're saying. So, let me know if this is what you guys want to see. Okay, so once my leg comes over and he grabs this leg, is this the one? Like Correct. He's, like if you're not letting it out. Like you're really so is that what you're saying? Like can't come out? Yes, sir. That's right. Okay, this is a really good question. Actually, this happens a lot and uh, it can create a problem for me to get up, right? Because I want to get up that way, right? I want to come up, I want my hips to go out. I want to escape my, my hips this way, right? But I can't do that if he's holding my leg. So sometimes being patient here, he'll, he'll let go a lot of times just because he's also in a stalemate, you know? But if he doesn't let go, instead of holding the body, I'm gonna hold the tricep, okay? And my intention right now is gonna be to finish him in a normal product, but in a different direction, okay? And it doesn't even really look like a finish. Most people won't tap to this, most people will roll, and that's fine too. So basically, I just bring my knee that's up to the floor, that's it, okay? I just turn away from him here. And if he doesn't roll, he's gonna tap. But if he does roll, he's gonna let go of my, my leg, okay? And then I've used it as a sweep. I can take side control from here, I can back step to mount, or if you're really omoplata hungry, you can re-roll again. And look, you're back in that same position, or you can push forward and come back up. Awesome, awesome. So we're turning the opposite direction. We're turning away from the body instead of into the body. And you're gonna leave your leg there. You're gonna let them take your leg. But they're not gonna want that leg at all once they feel their shoulder getting tweaked. They're gonna let go of everything they got to do a forward roll. Because if they don't, they're gonna get tapped out right there. Perfect, thank you. Now, yeah, asking, does it change anything if they're grabbing the other leg? Or do you do everything the same? <laughs> Let's see this. So you're saying if I'm here and he grabs like that, Yes, sir. This is a, a present. So I'm gonna use my other free leg to come oh, up yes. and pull through. Damn. Yes. And get I an like early that. finish. I like that. And the nice thing is he can't tap. <laughs> I see so a smile on face. Extra sound effects. <laughs> Beautiful. So that can work if he's holding here. And I just have to make sure I can get a grip. But if I'm usually here, I'm usually crossing my legs, right? I'm usually here. And then he still grabs the foot, but not the close foot. He grabs my other foot, right? And then if I can't reach it, I can always lift and bring my, bring my foot to me so I can get it. You see? Or sometimes if I can't reach with this hand, I can come up and I can reach farther now. But the, the trick is that this foot, the foot doing the omoplata, has to come behind the elbow towards the armpit, okay? And then with my two hands on his sleeve or his wrist, I pull and I kick from here to get the finish from this position. Beautiful. Thank you. So we got a lot of excitement, a lot of grins, a lot of thumbs up and people clapping. Luckily, a lot of them are muted. Awesome. Uh, Next, we have a question from Nacho. Nacho, if you're able to unmute yourself and fire away here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. So I was wondering, when you're setting up with the lasso, I, I like to get in the lasso quite a bit if I can. 
with that inversion roll that you're doing, um, yeah. is there a way that the opponent can stack you? If, I, I see how you're flaring out, but if you don't flare out hard enough, are they going to stack you down and defeat that? Or is it pretty much go full tilt boogie as soon as you get into it? When you commit to the, the inversion, you got to go, go for it. You know, and you can't stop halfway because if you do, then yeah, you'll be stuck with your lasso in like north south position or in side control. You got to really make sure that that his arm doesn't get around your head. Okay, so this free hand that he has, I have to really sorry, guard that hand with this free hand. Okay, so make sure you're ready to block this hand. Okay. Some people will think about the spin too much and use this hand to help them spin, but then they leave their head free and he can grab my head and now I'm stuck here. Maybe the best thing that could happen out of here, this would be a very unlikely bicep walk, which is only legal for brown and black, but kind of hard to finish this one these days. You know, so probably I'll get stuck in side control out of that. You know, you're getting your guard passed. So it's really important that we make the spin efficient. You can practice that by doing a really slow sideways roll. Staying on top of your shoulders. This might be the best way to practice this movement on your own with a lot of control. And I want to challenge you guys to do, if you do do this, try to challenge yourself to keep your, at least always one foot on the mat at a time. So your feet never come floating up in the air. You know? So you stay here. I even try to avoid touching my head on the floor. Okay, just my top of my shoulders. I want to avoid touching my head just for safety on this movement because we don't want to cause like spinal uh, stack, stacking problems, right? We just tuck our chin to our chest and go. But the, the movement that we use to do the sideways roll is the same because my toes have to be digging into the mat as I'm moving. So you want to practice doing this one quickly, okay? Doing all the points of control, foot on the hip, hand on the wrist. Give yourself plenty of space. Be generous, put on the floor, and then when you decide to go, I'm gonna hold this wrist as long as I can, and once my head goes through, I can let it go, okay? And then I move back right away. I don't want to hang out under there at all. I go right away. And a lot of the time, your partner will make it easier on you. Not on purpose, of course, but because he's looking for the pass. So when he starts to look for the pass this way, he starts to pass here, I'm blocking that arm. He's already gone halfway for me, you see, by passing my guard. A little trick I like to do here is also with my elbow. I'll keep my elbow pointed up at his head like a spike. So that way he can't get too close to me, right? I keep my elbow pointed up. If I keep it tight to me, it's real comfortable for him to put his head tight on my chest, okay? So I keep my elbow pointing up. I keep holding his wrist. My foot is still on his hip here. The more he tries to pass my guard, the easier it is for me to go. We were talking about uh, the fight with Ken Primiola earlier. And this is actually the same entry I used against him. Except he was passing my guard. He was in lasso passing my guard. And then it was very similar to this, you know, a slightly modified version, but that's pretty much what it was. Uh, awesome. But you guys can see that if you look up, uh, it was New York Open. If you just look New York Open, Claude Gracie, I'm sure you'll find this. I think it was 2012, the New York Open. New York, Claude Gracie, you'll probably find this fight. Or Ken Premiola, Claude Gracie. I remember that I remember that fight. Actually, I remember you you and several others were in some like news article about like how comfortable you looked while he stood up and you were in it and you're just hanging out. And <laughs> yeah. you had some other videos of like handsome fellas like running a marathon, looked super comfortable and things like that. Um, how do you deal if they in that situation he stood up? Um, do you just I, I know patience is a big part of of how you use to finish. Uh, do you have a particular thing to get them back down? I know you reached around uh, to the front again and something like that. Is that another position you use when they stand from that position if they're really strong? 
Yeah, we can talk about that. Uh, there's like lots of different stages. Once the guy's standing up, whether he's bent over, whether he has you off the ground, whether he's standing up postured, but you're not off the ground yet, you know, depending on if you had grips, if you didn't have grips. If you watch that fight that we're talking about, he does actually stand up, right? <laughs> and, uh, but I had really good grips like before he stood up. So I was really comfortable with, uh, with the position. But, um, yeah, yeah if you stay to that, you want to, you think that the majority, we have a huge range of, of uh, people here. Sure. Uh, so any particular stage you can maybe share with us would be great. So from inside old plot, I got here and he starts to stand up. If I feel like I'm going to lose the position and maybe his arm may slip out from like a quick explosion, you know, I'll make sure, you know, my, I'm holding the arm. I'm locked up on the, on the arm here. My knees are tight. And my hand can even come through my legs and grab his lapel. So now this guarantees that my legs won't shake off his, his arm, right? I want to make sure I don't lose his elbow is the main key, okay? But there's also something really major I got to watch out for here is him stepping over my head with this leg here. If he steps over, it's going to create a lot of problems for me. So I have to... Uh, guard that leg, and right? have to mark that leg, make sure he doesn't get over. But uh, so I usually like to hold hold that the knee or the or the end of the pants, something to make sure he doesn't he can't get up. But when he is trying to stand up, a lot of times what I look for is my my far leg will start to look for that that knee. So I'll, I think you. So I'll use my foot right here to look for his leg. And if I can find that hook under the leg, it's really easy to finish now. I'll just stretch out and get the finish. And so this is an early finish for the old father. Okay, so this is one you can look for. This grip between your legs. Once, he, once he's standing up, or once he's on his way to stand up, you can look for this grip to guarantee he won't slip out if you feel like you're fighting a very explosive opponent. And all the while, you know, I'm, I'm watching out for this leg. I'm building that wall. I might be using my elbow if he's putting his knee on my stomach like he is right here. I put my elbow inside and try to get his knee behind me. Right, right here, I'm good. Once he's behind me, I'm good. I don't want to let him be able to step over me. And then I can start working to get back up, to get back up, and to my finish. Right? Even if he tries to roll sideways, even over me, it's okay. But, uh, like I said, there's lots of stages of that position. You know, he can, he can uh, stand up before I got the grips. He could, um, he could stand up with my grips like, I, like in that match that I did. So a lot of different things can happen right there. But, uh, if you, you know, if there's a specific one, I'm happy to look at it as well. Did all that make sense for you guys? It yeah. did. That was awesome. Uh, awesome. Your, Liz's mind is blowing. I'm just going to let Liz talk. We should just unmute Liz and have her ask you questions. because she's yeah, going she had saucer eyes. I don't know if it was because of your hair <laughs> professor. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That's Where awesome. is Liz? Liz, Liz say hello, please. Unmute yourself. Don't be shy. I'm shy, though. Right, oh, Liz. by the way, Liz is a nurse, and we got to say thank you for her. For her son. Oh, thanks. Thank you for your service, Liz. Thank you. Online. You're welcome. Frontliner. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, if you have any questions for, for Professor, please put them in the chat. In the meantime, we're going to go back to a lifestyle question for you, Professor. And this is coming from Jovan, uh, who's been training jujitsu for about nine years now with his son, who is currently 12. And he's wondering, uh, as a lifelong practitioner, have you ever felt a loss of interest, especially during your teenage years for training? Um, when I was uh, maybe like 15, 17, it, I didn't have like, uh, you know, at that age, you're like on your way to an, on a, being an adult. You're, you don't have a car yet. You start to have an opinion about things that you want to do, you don't want to do a little bit more. At that time, it was a little bit harder for me to get to the academy because uh, I was also going to Brazil a lot. And uh, 
I didn't have transportation and stuff like that. And uh, I got a little bit lazy with my friends and stuff. But uh, there was, you know, a short period, but I never really fully lost it. You know, I just, I just didn't train as much as I, I could have. But um, when I was with my dad, I mean, in, especially in the States, it was like a regular, you know, I would just go to his academy every day because he's there. So I would just meet him there after school and then that would just be a very, for me, a regular thing. But I think there's so many reasons to train <laughs> jujitsu. You know, I have some nephews that don't really want to train also. And I just, I try to give them examples of why it's so important to train, you know. And Half Gracie has a meme that he, he made. He said it really well. It's like, what if one day somebody wants to take something from you? You know what I mean? You got to be able to, uh, <laughs> you got to be able to do something about it. Maybe he's doing something not to you, but to your, to someone that you care about, you know. So it comes down to self-defense. I look at Jiu-Jitsu as like, a way of security, you know, in the end, like you can hold yourself well because you feel confident in your training and, and your capabilities, you know, and, and uh, you know, we, we treat jujitsu like a game, like a sport. And so when we fight someone double our size, we don't really think about it. Like, wow, that guy was just trying to kill me right now. He was just trying to choke the life out of me and try to break my arm, you know, and we would just tap and keep going or maybe, you know, we could survive or maybe we'd win. But that, that like in your self-conscious, in your subconscious, I think builds a crazy amount of, of inner confidence. You know, like when, when something really, hopefully never, right? But if it ever does happen to you, you're that much more prepared. And you imagine like the average person who is, is very foreign to any kind of uh, combative sport, any combative art, you know, it's very, uh, they would be completely out of their out of their comfort zone. So the fact that we can create a comfort zone in something that the whole world looks to be very uncomfortable, that I think is something very special. And I think that that alone is a is a huge reason to continue to train jiu-jitsu. Not to mention the obvious benefits of you know just physical exercise and making good friends within the school. You know, I think that the relationships that we make. Uh, you know, I met. I met uh, a bunch of you guys in uh, Professor Buyu's school many years ago, and I still keep in touch with them. They still send me happy birthday, <laughs> you know, like happy Father's Day, guys like Diesel and uh, Ceviche and, uh, you know, Professor Buyu himself. You know, we all stay in touch. And what kind of a community is that? You know, like that's, that's very special that, that they're on the other side of the country, you guys are on the other side of the country, and, and we still stay in touch. We keep, we have jiu-jitsu in common. And it's an amazing, like, just network of people that we, you know. Brandon here grew up with jiu-jitsu as well. He's been all over the world teaching jiu-jitsu just because he loves jiu-jitsu. And people see that he loves jiu-jitsu. And they want to have him. They want to they share his love. They want to they hear about it. They want to see his passion for jiu-jitsu. And, uh, and, you know, they bring him out because, you know, he likes to compete. He likes to, to teach. And uh, it's it's, it's I, I'll, I'll go on too long if I just keep talking about reasons to train jiu-jitsu, but, but definitely, uh, you know, I think because you guys that ask the question, you have it in your family, right? It's a, it's a kind of a family sport. So I think it'll never leave completely. Maybe, maybe someone might get a little bit tired of it for a little bit, but something I think to encourage uh, people to train a little bit more is get one of a friend involved. If they have a friend to bring, that not only helps the school, brings another person to the school, but also it's fun to do something with your friend, right? If you have a friend at the school, especially if they come from outside of the school, I think that's a huge motivation to keep coming to the academy, especially for that age group, like teenagers. Great advice, hopefully that helps, Javon. Thank you, Professor. Um, we have a question from uh, Professor Tom. He's wondering if you feel any extra pressure during competition because of your last name. It's a huge stressor, just performance anxiety in general, but being a Gracie, what type of additional pressure does that put on you when you compete, if any? Yeah, I actually grew up in an environment where I hear my father and his brothers and my cousins and all these older people in my family saying things like, uh, you know, you can't lose, I'm, I'm undefeated, you know, all these undefeated people in my family, which these days doesn't exist, you know, 
doesn't really exist anymore. People that go in the sport undefeated become champions and they're undefeated because everybody will go experience that at some point, you know? But, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, I think because my family were the people that kind of first learned it, first started doing it and introducing it around the world, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely was some pressure, but the beautiful thing was, I feel like once I hit black belt, that pressure went away. It started going away at brown belt, but black belt, it went away because the people that I was fighting at black belt were guys like Marcelo Garcia. You know, he was in my division. I actually never fought him, but my first two years at, at, uh, at Worlds at black belt, he was in my division. So I felt like if I lose to a guy like that, it's not really a big deal. You know, I don't think it would be such a big deal. And all the guys are tough. Everybody could have a good day, a bad day. So things like that, you know, uh, one, an older guy told me one time, and just, he told me, don't fight for your family. Don't fight for anybody. Just fight for yourself. Fight for your own experience. Fight for, you know, the experience, you know, wh what you're going to benefit from that experience, you know. And uh, because in the end, all these champions and all these new people coming in, they're not going to remember the old champions. They're not going to remember anybody. It's just in the end, it's like, yeah, beautiful legacy and all that. But in the end, it's just... It's just what stays with you and the little experiences that you have in you that, that build your person, your character. I think that's the, that's the biggest benefit from the competition, you know, putting ourselves in adverse situations, which we do in the academy all the time. But uh, things like that help me a lot. You know, people telling me things to kind of alleviate. My, my father didn't help me at all. He made things a lot worse as far as the pressure, you know made me feel like I had to win all the time uh, from a young age because at his, when he was my age, at a, as a teenager, young 20s, he, you know, was very athletic and, and, and not too many people, I believe, probably not, not like today, right? A lot of people didn't know jiu-jitsu, especially as well as he did or as well as, you know, the family in general. So a lot of people in the family could say that they were undefeated or or nearly undefeated, you know, only lost a few times because it was such a big part of, you know, growing up for them. But these days, like, I actually feel a lot more sorry for my son's generation, you know, what's going to happen there, you know, because for me, you know, uh, growing, growing up, maybe in, in high school, you would find a, a couple people that maybe would, do, would have done jiu-jitsu or maybe they knew about jiu-jitsu and that was about it. Nowadays, everybody's doing jiu-jitsu. Go to any school, there's kids doing jiu-jitsu, and the kids are actually good, you know? So the competition that my son's generation, these kids that are coming up right now are going to have, is going to be way tougher than I think what I had to go through. You know, and the amount of competitors, is, it's crazy. So that helps you take off the pressure when you know, like, how high the level is, you know? That's a great thing to see that the beautiful art is spreading this large. Um, before I turn it over to Professor Tom, Professor Buyu for closing remarks, Professor Clark, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend it with our Ghost Squad family here. And uh, we appreciate your passion, uh, all of our instructors, Professor Buyu, Professor Tom, thank you so much for your passion and love of the sport. And uh, I will turn it over to Professor Tom, Professor Buyu for closing remarks. Thank you. That was a, that was a great uh, technique, of course, but uh, we're, we're super lucky to have you, of course, and uh, I really appreciate the message, probably more than anything, because we do have white belts, we even have some children sitting here listening, and when they hear somebody like you talking about, you know, uh, the importance of, you know, not just putting the pressure on, but, but keeping it real, right, and the importance of jujitsu and the community and all those other things that you mentioned, uh, so the message is, is just as, as beneficial as the technique. So I appreciate that from you, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, to be here. I'm, I'm suspicious to say, because, you know, I, I always a uh, big fan of your works. Like, uh, since the days I just trained Rodrigo, you know, uh, and uh, we, we made a good relationship as we met. Uh, and then... For me, it's just like a, a very honorable moment to be able to have all my students listen, watching, know who you are, and still keep in contact with you. Because um, the way that I see, I can get a little hook what you're saying. 
medals will pass, titles will pass. Yeah, stay back in the days, they maybe didn't have the many challenges that we do have nowadays when we step on the mats, you know, the name of the family. Uh, back in the days, there were small tournaments, few competitors. Nowadays, you look at a bracket that has tons of people, tons of good people. Um, but everybody, like you said, can have a good day, a bad day. But what stays having a bad day or a good day is the friendship that we build with the jiu-jitsu community from coast to coast. Uh, right now, I'm here in Miami. It's 821. It's three hours behind for, for Tom. I, I Maybe like, I don't know, five hours behind for you. So... And three, we two. always, three, two, all right. So it's always that connection um, that we make through jiu-jitsu, you know. Um, and if you allow me, in your behalf, I will say this, you know, whoever doesn't know or whoever, uh, or whoever doesn't have or whoever does have, if you want to keep in touch with Clark, I will tell Clark to give his address of his gym. I'm sure he's going to have open arms for every one of us that travels to California. Uh, follow him on Instagram, uh, giving him support, because I think that's, uh, that's what makes the uh, jiu-jitsu community better. You know, when we support each other, there's nothing that can stop us because love comes as a big, huge wave, you know. And, uh, yeah, we have good days. We have bad days. Even on the mats, you know, people that don't compete, uh, people don't like to feel that pressure, the anxiety. Man. Uh, as a matter of fact, I tell my students, I, I will never force them to do something that they don't like to. If they like to compete, great. I'll train them. I guide them. But if they don't want to, that's totally fine. I do because I like it. You know, I do because I enjoy. I do because I have uh, the opportunity to see people like you in Vegas, you know, your students, meet your students, you know, see my friends like Tom, Amir. You know, that's a big way that we can get together. Uh, but from the bottom of my heart, man, thank you so much for your time, for you putting your gi. And I, I'm, a little, uh, I'm a little jealous because I know you probably were training before because you came all sweaty and said, man, this guy is a lucky boy because he's sweaty and we are here like uh, with the finger. But you know what? The good thing is, one thing I'm going to tell you this, everyone that's been doing us, like the, the chat, right, the Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.30 here, when they come back, they cannot say, oh, my neck hurts, my finger hurts, my knee hurts. Nothing's going to hurt. So I'm sure they're going to take smooth uh, sailing to when go back to train so they can have like a long life journey on this sport, you know, and be able to see people like you, your friend, you know, that's shared the knowledge with us. It's amazing, you know, and I hopefully like the kids that are watching this. Uh, they grasp something important that uh, no matter what the outcome, you know, the most important thing is the friendship that we, we connected to each other, keep training, you know, uh, everybody, I believe when they start in jiu-jitsu, they don't think, oh, when I'm going to get my black belt, you know, they just want to do a hip scape. They just want to do a front roll. Uh, they might be just want to survive five minutes with the blue, purple, brown belt. It's inside of the, the room, you know. And with time, yes, you make friendships, uh, you bring friends to the table, you know, you help the school. Hopefully, like, you, everybody's doing okay over there uh, for your circle, you know, yeah. and one day we can see each other again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're, we're over here. We, I, I recommend, you know, when we do have the opportunity to open our schools again, one thing we were thinking about doing is, uh, for example, me and Brandon, we train together a lot. So we say, okay, if you, if you feel healthy and you're not around anyone that's high risk then let's train together and we, you know we're on quarantine right now we're on lockdown but we limit ourselves to just like that you know we're just at one or maybe two two people you know a small circle of people that this can still train together and uh you know for all you guys that you know you're tuning in from, from being at home you know that's awesome you know that you guys are making the effort you know, you're not in the academy but you're you're staying present you're staying engaged you're staying, you're showing your sense of community within the school and, and, uh, and your passion for jiu-jitsu. So um, that's awesome. And, and we just got to keep, uh, keep the spirit strong. You know, I think this is a, like, this is a historical event, right? Not just for, for the world, but for jiu-jitsu. You know, it's, a, it's, it's forcing us to do something we've never done before, like just stop training. So it's a very crazy time for the whole world. And jiu-jitsu is a very small part of it, but, uh, but it's definitely affecting us. And, and I think, you know, in my, my lifetime, my father's lifetime, even, you know, I, I think that nothing like this has ever happened. 
so it's very interesting and uh but the most important is we stay safe out there right and uh let this thing pass and hopefully we can all get out of this healthy and ready to come back to the mat i have one more point to say to you talking about stopping training you know like some people you know oh, i stopped in training stop training professor tom tell everyone what you did uh when your kids are born, tell everybody so they can see what are talking about dedication. I don't know. He's talking about. We, he's talking about as soon as my kid was born. Seven hours later, I was on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, good. Day, you're good. I'm right, done you. here. I'm gonna be <laughs> <laughs> oh, straight to the match. Straight to the match. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, beautiful I, again. Professor, thanks everybody for, for joining for today. I'm going to put this on YouTube in the next day or two as soon as I can get it. It's a big file, but uh, I appreciate it. Everybody, I'm sure, you know, there was so many details that you're not going to get in just one little go through. So hopefully you get a chance to go back and there's so many things and I, and I know you have so much more to share, but in this amount of time, I, I super appreciate everything sharing with us. Thank you very much. I, I love, uh, you know, hopefully you have the opportunity to visit Miami again and, uh, Colorado is also awesome. So if I'm ever out there, I'll, I'll hit you guys up. And, you're, uh, you're always welcome. That'll be fantastic. Thank you so much. Snowboarding, yeah. snowboarding, Tom. Yeah, boy, yeah. we'll come out with you. We can all come together and have a little. Hey, Clark, my board is still there in Tom. So I'm sure like we're going to see beautiful places. Right, Professor Bill Clark, kid? Huh, Professor Bill? Huh, huh? Yeah. See, Professor, Professor Bill is a world champion in snowboarding in 1988. Just to let you know, you know, very skilled. His wife yeah. as well, everybody. The pot family is a super skill, man. We gotta see that. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's too he's too snowboarding what your family is to jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to learn some techniques. Next time we do a zoom on uh, on snowboarding, we'll to see them, you know? <laughs> Thank Let's you guys. Thanks everybody for coming. Have a great night, everybody. Have a good Thank night, you guys. everyone. Sure. Take care.